At the end of his earthly ministry, in John 16, 12, as we talked about last week, Jesus told us that there were still many additional truths that he wanted to share with us, we collectively humanity, that we were not yet ready to bear. But Jesus promised that when the spirit of truth came, God's spirit, that God's spirit was going to guide us, believers collectively, into that additional truth when we were ready. Here at Life Journey Church, we believe there are three great truths that, that God's Spirit is trying to download to the church of Jesus Christ in our time that finally humanity collectively is ready to hear. Number one, we believe here at Life Journey Church that women should be full and equal partners in spiritual community. Number two, we believe that lesbian and gay people should be full and equal partners in spiritual community. And number three, we believe that transgender people should be full and equal partners in spiritual community. Most churches in the world today have not yet received that truth, but we embrace it and we champion it here at Life Journey Church. Last week, we began by looking at the biblical case for full equality for women. Next week, we'll look at the biblical case for full equality for transgender people. Today, though, we're going to focus on the biblical case for full equality for lesbian and gay people in spiritual community. We have a lot of territory to cover today. So fasten your seatbelts, put on your safety helmet, keep your arms and legs inside the vehicle while it's moving, and we'll see how much we can accomplish today. Let's start with a prayer. God, we treasure the Holy Scriptures. We want to understand and apply them faithfully and thoughtfully as Jesus would want us to. Guide us today as we grapple with the revolutionary significance of two great gospel passages. Speak, Lord. We ask in the name of Jesus. <clears throat> Amen. A young woman in her uh, 20s was driving through West Texas on her way back home to California when she stopped in a small town diner, walked in, took a seat at the counter, sitting on a stool, she ordered her lunch. Before long, an older guy comes in wearing a big cowboy hat, cowboy boots, a big belt buckle, weathered face, calloused hands, sat down on the stool next to her and ordered his lunch. Before long, the young woman leans over to him and says, are you a real cowboy? He says, well, Missy, yes, I reckon so. I spend all day, every day, riding horses, roping cattle, mending fences. I guess you could say I'm a genuine cowboy. Cool, she says. Then the old guy says to her, and tell me, Missy, what are you? She says, oh, I'm what you call a lesbian. <laughs> a lesbian, he says. What's that? She says, well, I spend all day, every day, thinking about beautiful women. I get up in the morning, and I'm thinking about women. I, I eat my lunch. I'm thinking about women. I go home at night. I think about women. When I sleep at night, I dream about women. I'm what you would call a lesbian. Oh, the old guy says as he drifts off deep in thought. Before long, she finishes her lunch, excuses herself, and she's on her way. A couple other tourists come into the diner, sit down on the stools next to the old cowboy, and before long, one of them says, are you a real cowboy? The old guy says, well, I used to think so, but I just learned I'm a lesbian. In 
in popular culture, there is a lot of confusion about what it means to be lesbian or gay. Especially in conservative churches, there is this negative stereotype of gay and lesbian people as being godless hedonists who are in an endless quest for the next great fleshly pleasure. People who, uh, the, the negative stereotype is that LGBTQ people are people who d disrespectful of family values. But that's not me. If you're an LGBTQ person here today, you probably say as well, that's not who I am. I grew up in church learning to love God. In fourth through sixth grade, I had a Sunday school teacher that would tell the great stories of the Bible with such passion and such excitement. It was contagious, and, and I became captivated by God. I started reading a chapter in my Bible every day, and in Sunday school, we would sing songs, and, and my favorite song was, Tell me the stories of Jesus I love to hear. Things I would ask him to tell me if he were here. Scenes by the wayside, tales of the sea. Stories of Jesus, tell them to me. I loved that song. That was my love song to God. I couldn't get enough. Tell me more. I want to know everything that I can about Jesus. In some families, it's the parents who drag their kids to, to church. In my family, I was the one who was dragging my parents to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night. I couldn't get enough when I was 14 years old. During an altar call in church one Sunday, I came forward and for the first time consciously invited Jesus into my heart as my Lord and Savior. That was December the 13th, 1972, my spiritual birthday, so to speak. When I graduated high school, I went to a Bible college in South Carolina to train to become a preacher. And me and my friends, every Saturday we would load in, in, in a car and we would drive 60 miles to the University of South Carolina where we would be out on the sidewalks trying to buttonhole students as they walked by to see if they would talk to us about Jesus. I know that sounds kind of creepy, but that's how us Baptists roll. <laughs> it's who I was. It was in the very fiber of my being. Jesus was and is everything to me. But at this same time, when I was developing this beautiful, wonderful, loving relationship with God through Jesus Christ, I was also beginning to realize that I was different, that I was what people would call gay. And that confused me because the only thing I knew at that time, this was back in the Paleolithic era, the only thing that I knew back in that day was what I had heard at church, which was the Roman, Romans one way of becoming gay. You may be familiar with that passage where Paul talks about people who reject the one true God and begin worshiping idols and in, as they get on that slippery slope to degradation they start doing all kinds of crazy terrible destructive things in an endless hedonist quest to find uh, some new exciting source of pleasure and as part of that men naturally oriented toward women start having sex with men in experimental encounters and women naturally oriented toward men start, start having encounters with, with women and as it was presented in my church, that is the bottom of the godless slippery slope. And I heard this many times and thought to myself, but that's not who I am. That's not me. No doubt there are some people in the world who've walked that Romans 1 path to degradation in their lives. But that wasn't me. I just wanted to love Jesus to meet somebody, to fall in love, to settle down, and to share life. For better or worse, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. And I found myself wondering, does the Bible have anything to say to people like me? As a young adult in my 20s, 
I began to really dig into this and study in depth and was startled to see that the Bible has a whole lot to say to people like me that they never told me in Sunday school. Today, I want to share some of that with you. I found myself thinking in just the 25 minutes that I have, actually, if I'm going to be honest, in the 30 minutes <laughs> that I have, okay, to be really honest, in the at least 35 minutes that I'm going to take here today, what can I share in that short amount of time that will meaningfully get us into such an important question? And as I prayed and thought about this, I want to share with you today two great gospel passages that are powerfully relevant to the question of can a person who loves Jesus live with a life partner in a loving, committed relationship with the pleasure of God. I want to share with you two great gospel passages that are powerfully relevant to that question, just to begin to get our feet wet. And then if, if your appetite is whetted and you want to dig deeper, I invite you to get a copy of the book that I've authored called The Children Are Free. By the way, that phrase, the children are free, is something Jesus said in Matthew chapter 17. The title of the book is The Children Are Free, Reexamining the Biblical Evidence on same-sex relationships. It's a book that covers every conceivable scripture passage relevant to the question that we're talking about today. I wrote it years ago as a resource in our church. We put it on Amazon. It took off, and now the book has been translated into seven different languages, not by us, but by indigenous Christian groups across the globe who, who are looking for a resource that summarizes the modern scholarship on the Bible and homosexuality in terms that a grandma or a teenager can understand. It's really cool to think that a resource published by this church, by the way, I get no, all proceeds from this resource come to the church. But it's really cool to think that a resource that this church has published is saving lives across the globe and changing churches across the globe. You never know what God is going to do. We do our best and God does the rest. So if you want to dig deeper, get a copy of that book. But today, to get us into the subject, let's look at two great gospel passages. If you've been in this church for a while, you've probably heard me talk about these two passages, but there are people here who've never heard it before, and they need to hear this good news. And all of us need to brush up and refresh ourselves so that we're prepared to go out there and be champions for equality for LGBTQ people in the world today. As we dive into this first gospel passage, first, we need to remind ourselves of some important cultural background. As you are probably aware, in ancient Greek culture, it was acceptable for one man to express romantic affection for another man. That gave rise to a whole genre of ancient Greek literature and poetry where one man is expressing his romantic affection for another. I want to share with you two examples of poems taken from that ancient Greek genre and it'll become apparent to you here in a second why this is so relevant to the gospel passage that we're going to talk about today. The first of these two poems written by Theocritus goes like this. Alas, he writes, for this difficult and misfortunate malaise of mine. This is the second month a feverish passion has possessed me for a pais, P-A-I-S, is the Greek word. It's the Greek term of endearment that the poet uses to refer to this beloved other. This is the second month a feverish passion has possessed me for a pais of mediocre beauty, although from head to toe he's solid charm all over, and sweet the smile upon his cheeks. For yesterday in passing, he glanced at me through his eyelashes, surreptitiously, ashamed to stare me straight in the face, and blushed. Thereupon, infatuation grabbed a little more of my heart. Of course, this is a poem about what we would call love at first sight, infatuation. But as we know, infatuation sometimes leads to something deeper, deep, mutual love. The second poem reflects that kind of love, written by a poet, na poet named Meliager. The cables of my life, Miscus, are fitted to you. 
In you too is the last breath of my soul. For yes, by your eyes, Pais, there's that same Greek term of endearment. Yes, by your eyes, Pais, which speak even to the deaf, and yes, by your shining brow, if ever you cast a clouded look upon me, I see winter. But if you look kindly, sweet spring has bloomed. These are just two of literally hundreds of ancient Greek poems in this genre. Scholars tell us that the go-to common term of endearment that is used throughout this genre of Greek literature is that word pais, that term of endearment you heard in those two poems. There are literally hundreds upon hundreds of surviving instances of ancient Greek literature using this word pais as the key term of endearment that one man uses when expressing his affection to another. With that as background now, let's turn to the first of our two gospel passages. You heard John read it just a little while ago. Matthew chapter 8, beginning at verse 5, we're told that when Jesus entered Capernaum, a Roman centurion came to him saying, Lord, my pais. Remember, Matthew's gospel was written in ancient Greek. So here, the centurion speaking to Jesus uses the precise word that we just saw, that term of endearment that one man used to refer to his beloved other. When the centurion entered Capernaum, or when Jesus entered Capernaum, a Roman centurion came to him saying, Lord, my pais is lying at home paralyzed in terrible distress. Did anybody just feel a jolt of electricity? Oh my goodness. They never told me this in Sunday school. Now, let me be quick to add that the ancient Greek term pais was a versatile word that can have one of three different meanings depending upon the context in which it was being used, just like many English words have different meanings depending on the context in which they are used. This ancient Greek word pais was roughly equivalent to how we used the English term boy back in the 1800s. It had roughly the same three potential meanings. So pais, when used in first, in first century culture, could refer to and often referred to a male child, a young boy. So someone, if, if someone in English points to a, a young child and says, that's my boy, you know that what they're saying is, that's my child. Same with the word pais, definition or meaning, number one. But pais, pais was also used in a second sense to refer to male servants. Kind of like in the 1800s when a plantation owner was standing next to a field, if that plantation owner in that context pointed to a black man working in the field and said, that's one of my boys, unfortunately, we would understand that he wasn't saying, that's my child, that's my son, but rather that he was saying, that's one of my servants. Pais had that same meaning in first century Greek language. And thirdly, the word pais also, as we have seen in the examples I gave you, was the go-to term of endearment when one man referred to his beloved other of the same gender. In fact, pais was often used with meanings two and three coupled together. When I was a, a kid, my dad would sometimes refer to my mom as my girl. He didn't mean my little daughter. It was his term of endearment. In the 1800s, if a, if a woman was talking about her fiance and said, that's my beau, that's my boy, we understood that's a term of endearment. So, pais was sometimes used in the ancient world combining meanings two and three. What I mean by that is there were often servants who became their master's lovers. Now, in our world today, that is 
repugnant to us. It is outrageous that anyone who is in authority over someone else would enter into a romantic relationship with them. But remember, in the ancient world, even marriages were formed that way. A husband would contractually purchase his wife. He would, quote, own her, and she would be subjugated to him. And yet, many times, meaningful, mutual love would develop despite the brokenness of culture in the ancient world. Historians tell us that it was not unusual for commanders in the Roman army on their long deployments to take a lover, same-sex lover, from among their servants. So, when we put all of this together, and we come to Matthew chapter 8, and the centurion approaches Jesus and asks and says to him, my pais is at home, paralyzed, in great distress. We have to ask ourselves, in what sense was the centurion using that term? And I would submit to you that all available contextual, linguistic, and circumstantial evidence embedded in this gospel passage points us in the direction of the centurion using it as a term of endearment for his beloved servant with whom he had a loving relationship. What are those points of evidence? And you know, it's, it's easy when we come to a gospel, any passage, it's easy to come to it with a sense of, I already know what the Bible can and cannot say. It takes courage to let scripture passages lead us where they will, to follow the objective evidence where it takes us. If we follow the objective evidence in this passage, there are several things that are very important to note, and this gets very technical, but I want to give me three minutes to hit the high points of some of these technical points because it's critically important to have that at your fingertips as you consider this passage. Luke, in his gospel, tells the same story as Matthew in Luke chapter 7. In Luke's telling of this story, he repeats the word pais when referring to the sick man in the story, but Luke also goes on to use an additional term when referring to that sick man, and that term is doulos. Doulos was a term that in ancient Greek was never used to refer to a child, to a son, but was rather a generic term that referred to servants. So the fact that Luke uses the term doulos and applies that to the sick man precludes the possibility that the sick man in the story was the son of the centurion. But when Luke uses that term doulos to refer to the sick man, he is careful to put an adjective in front of doulos. Intimos is the adjective Luke puts in front of doulos. Intimos doulos means special servant. So that when Luke refers to the sick man as the servant of the centurion, he's careful to point out to us that this was a servant who had a special relationship with the centurion. In the centurion's own words, when the centurion is quoted in these passages as speaking about the sick man, the centurion himself makes a verbal linguistic distinction between his generic servants and the sick man. The, sir, the, the centurion, when he's talking to Jesus and says to Jesus, I'm a person in authority. I have servants, and I tell them what to do, and they do it, and I believe you, Jesus, have the same authority to give the command to heal the one who is sick. When he's talking about his generic servants, he uses the term doulos, but then when he starts talking about the sick man, the centurion shifts and uses the word pais, drawing that verbal distinction between his generic slaves and this special servant. Finally, the circumstantial evidence in this passage is important. To understand this passage, we have to be able to explain psychologically and emotionally what could have possessed a powerful Roman centurion, the oppressor that was overseeing the oppression, the suppression of the Jewish people what could have possibly motivated him to crash through all kinds of barriers of culture, class, religion, and status and power 
to go to this Jewish rabbi and plead for healing for one of his servants. The oppressor going to the oppressed, the Gentile going to the Jew, the unbeliever going to the teacher. What could have possibly motivated him to break through all of those cultural barriers and go to Jesus? I think we all know full well in our own human experience what motivates that kind of drive, determination, I'll stop at nothing. It's called love. So that every available piece of linguistic, textual, and circumstantial evidence in this gospel passage is pointing us toward the conclusion that when the centurion came to Jesus and pleaded with him for a miracle of healing for his pais, he was using it in the, as a term of endearment to refer to his servant who was his beloved partner. Now, try to imagine if you were an observer there, taking all of this in, in that gospel story, what that must have been like. I picture this, this centurion before he ever comes to Jesus, hearing through the rumor mill that there, it's, it's rumored that there is this great Jewish rabbi who has miracle working power, who's actually healed people, and a light bulb goes off in his head, and he says, maybe this is the answer, maybe this can help. There's just something inside him that says, this is true. I need to seek out this Jesus. If he dared to share this information with any of his fellow commanders, they would have told him, are you crazy? You can't do that. You know how the Jews think about relationships like yours. They consider them an abomination in the eyes of God. He'll laugh at you. He'll turn you away. But when you're in love and when you're desperate and when there's no other answer, you do crazy things. So the centurion presses forward. Imagine as he's approaching Jesus, what must be going through his mind as he chokes out those words wondering how Jesus will respond. Lord, my, my pais is at home paralyzed in terrible distress. And then he holds his breath, wondering what kind of response is he going to get. No doubt, the good God-fearing Jews who were in the crowd surrounding Jesus at this moment must have been aghast that this Gentile dog would dare to come to their beloved Jesus to ask him to perform a miracle of healing that would preserve this abominable relationship. But Jesus was different. Jesus didn't skip a beat. Jesus simply said to the centurion, Matthew 8, 7, I will come and cure him. That's what prompted the centurion to say, Lord, I'm a person in authority. I have servants, doulos, that are under me. I tell them what to do. They do it. I believe you have the same power over the cosmos that you can just speak the words and my servant will be healed. And that knocks Jesus' socks off. <laughs> Jesus is so impressed, he turns to the crowd around him and he says to them, verse 10, truly I tell you, in no one in Israel have I found such faith. In other words, and imagine, imagine the shock of these, of these Jesus' fellow Jews who are surrounding him in the crowd when Jesus tells them that he is seen in this Gentile, sir, this Gentile centurion who's in this special relationship with his servant. Imagine their shock when Jesus says, this man, I'm seeing in his heart greater faith than anyone I've ever met among my own people. And then Jesus goes on to say, that this centurion is an example of the kind of people who will, as Jesus puts it, come from the east and the west. He's referring to the east and west borders of Israel. He's referring to the, the boundaries that people of faith in his day put on the extent of the grace of God. Unless you're one of us, you're not going to get into heaven. Jesus says of this centurion that he is an example of the kind of unlikely people 
who will come from the east and the west and sit down in the kingdom of heaven with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Wow, Jesus goes on to add pointedly, many in the crowd around him who thought they were in will be disappointed to discover that they're not. Whoa. Here is Jesus Christ himself. It should come as no shock to us. People were the same back then as people are today. Does anybody really think that Jesus never encountered a gay person? Here's a gospel story where all of the available evidence suggests Jesus encountered a gay person in a deep, committed, loving relationship. And what mattered to Jesus was not the man's sexual orientation, but the faith that he had in his heart. As the New Testament teaches, we are saved by grace through faith. We are saved by grace through faith. That's what mattered to Jesus in this gospel passage. And sisters and brothers, that is good news, not just for gay and lesbian people. It's good news for all people, the radically inclusive grace of Jesus Christ that breaks down barriers that we human beings with our limited understanding have tried to put up to keep people out of the kingdom of heaven. How many gay and lesbian people have been turned away at the gate throughout the centuries because even followers of Jesus haven't taken the time or had an openness of heart enough to really dig in to that gospel story and understand what is happening there. We need to be champions who share the good news that Jesus was different, that the only thing that mattered to Jesus was how much faith do you have in your heart? You know, there's just something about the way we humans are that when we encounter somebody who's different, we easily misunderstand and misjudge and, and, and get confused. One day, a, a, a priest was up in front of his congregation and it was time for the children's sermon. So the children were gathered around up at the altar and, and the priest pointed to his clerical collar and said to the kids, can anybody tell me why I wear this. One little girl raised her hands and said, raised her hand and said, because it kills fleas and ticks. <laughs> when we encounter somebody who's different, somebody who's presenting in a way that we've not experienced, we often get confused and misjudge and develop negative stereotypes. But that is not the way of Jesus Christ. What Jesus cares about is not superficial externalities, but rather the faith that is in a person's heart. Which brings us then to the other gospel passage that we're going to look at today. Again, we need a little bit of cultural background. You're probably familiar that in the Old Testament, there are all kinds of rules and regulations about what kind of food what kind of animals were deemed clean and unclean? Clean animals you could eat. Unclean animals were forbidden. They were declared to be an abomination. And therefore, if you associated with them, if you ate those animals, you would become an abomination. Those rules are listed in Leviticus chapter 11. And the, the listings of unclean animals animals are broken into three categories. Land animals, quadrupeds, four-legged animals, that you're not supposed to eat because they're unclean. Sea creatures that you're not supposed to eat. And birds of the air that you're not supposed to eat. In Leviticus chapter 11, for example, we're told that these you shall regard as detestable among the birds. They shall not be eaten. They are, there's the A word, an abomination. The eagle, kind of ironic on July 4th, right? That the eagle is called an unclean abomination. The, the eagle, the vulture, the seagull, the stork, and the bat. And on and on the list go. Have you ever found yourself wondering, what was the rationale for categorizing certain animals as unclean and others as clean? The Mercer Bible Dictionary 
explains this. The, the Mercer Bible Dictionary uh, is a scholarly Bible dictionary produced by the Baptist Seminary at uh, Mercer University. The Mercer Bible Dictionary explains it this way. These rules about unclean foods have been explained as early notions of hygiene and health, as allegories or simply as preferences of taste. But none of these explanations seems to work consistently. Instead, the key is probably the one stated in the rules themselves. The rules are for keeping Israel holy. What does that mean? The article continues with the explanation. Among the animals of Leviticus 11, the unclean are those of mixed or confused identity. If, for example, birds typically fly and quadrupeds walk, a quadruped that flies, i.e. the bat, Leviticus 11:19, is perceived as having a confused identity. It is unclean. The birds listed as unclean swim or dive or in some other way do not behave like birds are supposed to because everybody knows that birds shouldn't be playing around in the water. They're meant to fly. The principle is clear. The animal perceived as, quote, ordered, has its holiness and is clean. The animal having blurred identity is contaminated and to be avoided. Whoa. Are you following this? It will come as no surprise to you that this same line of thinking was also applied to people. To people who were different. For example, if you were a priest and you had any sort of physical blemish, you were not allowed to approach the altar, which was the symbol of the presence of God. In fact, if you were a priest, you were not allowed to approach the presence, the altar of God. If you were blind or lame, or one who has a mutilated face, or a limb too long, or one who has a broken foot, or a broken hand, or a bent back, or a dwarf, or a person with blemished eyes, itching disease, or crushed testicles. None of these persons shall come near to the curtain in the temple, or approach the altar, that they may not profane my sanctuaries, for I am the Lord. Really? Is that really what it means to say that God is holy? That God cannot stand to be in the presence of any person who does not meet some conventional human definition of a mainstream, whole-bodied, unblemished person. There is, by the way, a term for this way of thinking. It's called creation order theology. Creation th order theology, the, the rationale, that way of thinking can be summarized in a simple syllogism, a logical syllogism that goes like this. Quadrupeds, four-legged animals, land animals, were meant to walk, not fly. Bats are quadrupeds. Bats have four legs. But they fly. Therefore, bats are unnatural and unholy. Now, as you no doubt recognize, this same way of thinking, this same line of logic is often applied by the religious right against lesbian and gay people. The syllogism takes this form. Women were meant to love men, not other women. Lesbians love other women. Therefore, lesbians are unnatural and unholy. But then, along comes Jesus, and Jesus was different. Jesus brings a completely different perspective. Our second gospel passage, Mark chapter 7. At the beginning of the chapter, Jesus gets into a huge debate with the Pharisees, the religious right of his day, over all of these conceptions of who is clean and who is unclean, which animals, are, which food is clean, which food is unclean, what rituals and regulations do you have to follow to make sure that you don't get contaminated and you stay clean. And Jesus gets so fed up with the obsession of the Pharisees with these rules about being clean and unclean that he is finally ready to 
make a bold break with the Pharisees, a daring declaration that he knew was gonna be provocative and so dangerous it might even get him killed. Jesus summons the crowds to him and says, Mark chapter seven, verse 14, listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile. The physical characteristics of the creatures that you eat have nothing to do with the quality of your soul. There's nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out of a person, that's what defiles. Jesus goes on to add in verse 18, do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside can't defile since it enters not the heart, but the stomach and goes out into the sewer. And then Mark adds this clarion conclusion. Thus, Jesus declared all foods clean. Jesus declared all of God's creatures to be clean. So that in one fell swoop, he radically rejects creation order theology. And on what basis does he do that? He simply appeals to our common sense. Does anybody here really think that if somebody eats a mammal that flies, a bat, that makes them a bad person? Now, bats may not taste very good. Who knows? I've never tried one in our culture. We wouldn't want to try one. But Nobody, I mean, it's common sense. Nobody believes that if you eat a bat, that makes your soul bad. That affects your soul. No, the physical characteristics of the animals we eat are irrelevant to the quality of our soul. By the same logic, the physical characteristics of the person that someone loves doesn't affect the soul. It's irrelevant to the soul. Being a bad partner in a gay relationship can affect your soul. Just like being a bad partner in a straight relationship can affect your soul. Engaging in sexually irresponsible behavior as a gay person can adversely affect your soul just as engaging in sexually irresponsible behavior as a straight person can adversely affect your soul. But the, the gender of the person you love, the physical anatomy of the person you love is as irrelevant to Jesus as whether a bat has wings. That's why Jesus didn't skip a beat when the Roman centurion came to him and asked him to heal his pais, because what matters to Jesus is the faith that a person carries in their heart, not superficial externalities. The vast majority of quadrupeds that God created were made to walk on their legs, but a small minority weren't. They were given wings. The majority of men that God has made were meant to love women, but a small minority weren't. Some were meant to love men, and a small minority of women were made to love women. It is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes, or at least it should be. God is the author of creation's diversity. The same God who made the soaring hawk made the tunneling mole. The same God who made hairy spiders made dappled butterflies. Every creature God has created is useful in some way, although the mosquito comes pretty close to being not useful. <laughs> but who among us would dare to look God in the eye and criticize any creature? God has created. Actually, there was a time in the ancient world before the light of Christ when our ancestors in the faith dared to do just that and came up with all these long lists 
of people and creatures God had created that were abominations in their view. But then came the light of Christ, burning away the fog that trapped us, humanity, in incomplete revelation. That was two millennia ago now. It's high time that those who claim to follow Jesus stopped living in the Old Testament and stepped into the new. Listen to me and understand. If you're LGBTQ, you are beautiful in God's eyes. Let me close with this. Back in 1997, when David and I first moved back here to Indiana, and I became a pastor here at Life Journey Church, I met a woman named Kathy Saris, who was part of what was called Justice Inc., an organization that ran a gay hotline. She told me about a conversation she had one evening when she was staffing the hotline with a young woman in her 20s who lived in uh, southern Indiana. The young woman was emotionally distressed. She told Kathy that her younger brother, who was then in high school, had taken his life. She told Kathy that her younger brother had everything to live for. He was the typical all-American boy, captain on the football team, made straight A's at school, popular at school and in his church youth group. But he had a secret. He once shared his secret with his sister, provided she would swear to never tell a soul. He told her that he was gay. At church, He kept hearing messages about how people like him are an abomination in the eyes of God. And when you're at an impressionable age, if you keep hearing that from people you love and respect, you might just start to believe it. And if you become convinced that you are a detestable abomination in the eyes of God, what are you going to do with that? The only thing you can do to fix that is to get rid of yourself, to stop offending God. And so one day, this young man when he was all alone, made his way over to his grandma's house. His sister told Kathy he always felt really close to grandma. So he must have wanted to be close to her in his final moments. He snuck into her garage and hanged himself. And now his sister wanted to know What should I do? She said, everybody in the family is saying, we don't understand. He had so much to live for. Why? Why would he do something like this? Kathy, she said, should I break my promise and tell them? Kathy said, by all means, you must. You will honor your brother by sharing his truth. How many more children have to die? How many more adults have to die? How many more spiritual lives will be wrecked and destroyed by gatekeepers who want to erect barriers to the kingdom of God that Jesus Christ himself kicked down? It's blasphemous that they do it in the name of Jesus when he so emphatically rejected that way of thinking. Sisters and brothers, we need to go out and be champions for the fullness of the gospel. What matters to Jesus, what matters to God is not a person's sexual orientation. It's how much faith do you have in your heart? We are saved by grace through faith. Whosoever will may come. That is the truth of Jesus Christ.